This morning we're going to be looking at a lesson that I think is the very bedrock of what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be looking this morning really at a lesson that deals with our authority. From where do we gain our authority to please God? Let me ask you to open your Bibles to Revelation. In Revelation chapter 22, we're going to look at a passage that I know you know quite well. But I do want to touch on this just for a moment so that we can put in place in our minds some things relative to um, authority. As I said, it really does not matter what man says. It's what God has said that's important. In Revelation chapter 22, I want to read there with you at verse 18 and 19. The Bible here says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in the book. And if any man shall take away from the words of, of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So it's very clear as, as John, by inspiration, closes out the Bible, as he closes out this last book of the Bible, it's very appropriate that he would say, here it is. That's all there is. There's not going to be another revelation. And what God has given to us in the New Testament are the things that we are to be uh, living by. In Colossians 3, in verse number 17, the Bible says, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there has to be authority for what we do, but that authority must come from the Word of God. Turn with me over into Deuteronomy, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 4. In verse number two, I want to hit a couple of verses that show the very same thing that was stated there uh, in Revelation 22. In Deuteronomy chapter four and verse number two, the Bible says, ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Now, there are other passages that we could put in that we could talk about in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 22. Also in Proverbs 30 and verse number six, we see the very same thing, the idea, the principle of not adding to what God has said, not taking away from what God has said. Now, I want you to think with me just for a moment. If God has made a statement and when we add to God's statement, in effect, we're saying God did not give us enough. Or if we say, well, I know that's what God said, but I think, and we diminish from what God has said, we're saying God has said too much. But the point of the matter is when God speaks, you and I need to listen. Mankind needs to listen to what God has said. Look over with me to Matthew in Matthew chapter 15, look at what the Lord says uh, in these few verses. <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 15, I want to read beginning in verse number 7. He says there, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now that's in a nutshell what we're talking about. Bible authority. It does not matter at all what part of God's Word, the New Testament, that we begin to discuss. When we begin to talk about God's plan for man's salvation, that's exactly what we have to have in mind. That's what we must mean. God's plan. Not man's plan, but what has God said? Now, I'm sure most of us from time to time have had Bible studies with people. And we'll be reading and studying a passage, a verse. And they'll say, well, I know that's what it says, but I think. Or they'll say, I know that's what uh, the Bible reads, but I feel. Or they'll say, well, I know that's what it said, but my preacher said or somebody else said. You see, when we take that attitude, that mindset, we're never going to come. To know what God would have us do. Now by authority we mean here's how God has allowed things or, or given things for us that we're to do. 
we could look at and spend our time this morning and this week talking about how God establishes this authority by direct commandment, by necessary inference, or approved example. But there's another thing that happens so much when people look at Bible authority. As I said a moment ago, they'll say, I know that's what it says, but I think, and they'll add to or take away from it. I want us this morning in the time we have left to look at a law that's called the law of exclusion. A lot of people say, well, if it doesn't say it explicitly, then we're allowed to do it. Or if there is a principle there that we can build on. Or we're not, in, we're not living in that time anymore, so that doesn't apply to us. My friends, there is a law of exclusion. And I want to talk about that with you just this uh, time this morning, study with you on this uh, topic. Let me ask you a question. If I were to ask you to define the law of exclusion, what would you say? How would you define the law of exclusion? Well, most people say, well, I don't know exactly what that means. But we do. We just may not have heard it as a law of exclusion. The law of exclusion is a law that says whatever is not included is excluded. Now, we live by that on a day-to-day -day basis. For instance, we go into a restaurant and we sit down and we order a meal of uh, the food we want. And what we do is look at the menu and on that menu, we pick out what we're going to eat. The waitress comes and we say, well, I'll think I'll have a, a hamburger, a Diet Coke and fries. I don't know why I had the Diet Coke in there, but uh, have a hamburger and fries and a drink. Well, the waitress goes away and in a little while she comes back and she has a, a, a whole tray full of food and she puts it on the table. What do you say? You'll say, well, I didn't order that. I only ordered a hamburger, a Coke and, and fries. If there was not such a thing as a law of exclusion, she could say and rightfully say, well, you didn't say don't. We do that all the time. We live by that law all the time. We drive down the highway. And we see I, yesterday driving up, uh, as I came along, there was a speed limit sign, speed limit 70. What if I decided I was going to go 85? And the highway patrol stops me and he comes up to my door and he says, Sir, do you know you were driving 85 in a 70 mile per hour zone? What if I said to that man, well, it didn't say don't go 85. <laughs> I'd, probably be, I'd probably be really in trouble. You've never seen a speed limit sign that says 65, not 70, not 75, not 80, not 85. Because you know we understand that law of exclusion. What is not included is excluded. And we can apply that to everything uh, that we want to in our lives. Everything we think about falls into that. We, we make a statement and that's what we mean. And what we didn't state um, is excluded. Now, we do it all the time. But the question is, does God, does God, does God live by that law of exclusion? Well, I want us to look at some things and, 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 and let's talk about this law of exclusion when we come uh, to looking at Bible authority. Does God have to say, enumerate, and put it right down? And uh, are there not principles that we live by that tells us here are some restrictions in God's Word. Let me ask you to open your Bibles to Genesis. In Genesis chapter 6, we're going to look, and as we read this and as we study this, let's think to ourselves and, and, and remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to understand this law of exclusion. We're trying to understand Bible authority. And when we speak with our friends and our loved ones, and when we open the Bible and study it, Make sure we apply this principle as we study, as we teach others. And when we do that, I believe with all of my heart, we're going to be better prepared for daily living of our lives, but also in helping others see the need to adhere to God's Word and to apply this law. Because you see, you, you can already see if we don't have this uh, law in place, then we can go anywhere we want to in religion. 
We can say it about anything we want to as we worship God. Well, God didn't say don't. That happens when people talk about the instrument of music in worship. They'll say, well, God didn't say don't. And they think that's a law and they think that's acceptable with God. Look at Genesis chapter 6 and you know the context of Genesis chapter 6. We find that Noah has found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We understand that the rest of the world around, their, their thoughts were on evil continually. God said, I'm going to destroy that creation. But Noah, you found grace in my eyes and I am going to spare you. I'm going to save you, your son, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. Now, that's what God said. I want you to look beginning in verse number 14. God said, I'm going to destroy them, but you can save you and your family. Now, here's how God said, I want you to save your family. Here's how it's going to be, Noah. Verse 14 says, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shall thou make in the ark and shall pitch it within without with pitch. Now, I want to stop there just for a second. And you know how it goes on. But I want to look at verse 14. We'll talk about the others in a moment. But look at verse 14. Do you think God intended for Noah to understand the law of exclusion in verse 14? What did God say? He says, Noah, you make you an ark out of gopher wood. Does your verse say, uh, uh, your Bible say in that verse, Noah, make you an ark of gopher wood, not oak, not pine, not bodark, not on and on God would have gone naming uh, the various kinds of woods. You don't find that in your, your Bible, do you? Why? Because God said, build you an ark of gopher wood. The law of exclusion is in place. And Noah understood that. God, uh, Noah didn't stand there and say, well, why not? I don't know what gopher wood was, and I don't think you do as well. But let's just say, Noah speaking with God says, well, I think what I'll do is use white pine. White pine is wood, isn't it? And white pine is easy to, to use. It saws well. It nails well. But wood is wood. But God said, make you an ark of gopher wood. Noah understood the law of exclusion. Look on in this. He says, and this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. Now, let's just look at that. When God said to Noah, build this ark out of gopher wood, he didn't, he didn't have to say not and all these other things. But however, if God had said and did not expect us to understand the law of exclusion, and in verse 14, if God didn't use the law of exclusion, and he would have said, now build you an ark out of gopher wood, not. And he would have enumerated all the woods. I, and I'm sure God knows every kind of wood. When he comes to the very next verse, verse 15, when he begins to talk about this ark, the length of it shall be 300 cubits, not 301, not 302, not 303, not 304. How, how many numbers do you think God would know? And let me ask you a question. How, lo how long do you think or large do you think the Bible would be just in those two verses if the law of exclusion did not play a part? I don't think we could carry the Bible. Because you see, when God said not 301, he would have also, if he was going to be not having Noah understand and expecting Noah to live by the law of exclusion, he would have also had to said not 389. And on down he would have to go with that. And that's just for the length. We've got to deal with the width of it, the height of it, the number of windows, the number of doors. But the Bible goes on and it talks about these various things. But I want you to come down to verse number 22 with me. Verse number 22, it says, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. And then we go into Hebrews chapter 11, where the Bible there says concerning Noah. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. By faith, 
Noah prepared an ark. Verse 6 of Hebrews 11 says, Without faith it is impossible to please Him, for all that comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Okay, by faith Noah prepared an ark. What does that mean, by faith Noah prepared an ark? Romans 10 verse 17 tells us, Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So we take that and we put it together in our study, and what do we find? If I'm going to live by faith... It will be because I recognize God's authority. And in that recognition of God's authority, I put it into the equation of the law of exclusion and do what God said, not what I think's best. But what did God say? The Bible says, thus did Noah, watch, according to all that God commanded him, so did he and that applies to us as well in our lives look at uh, second kings chapter 5 in second kings chapter 5 what do we find here we find a man named naaman and what about him well he was a leper and we know that naaman went and uh, in verse 9 of uh, second kings let me get to second kings in 2 Kings chapter 5, when, when we notice in this, he has come and what happens is he's told what he ought to do. What did it say about that? Uh, Naaman, uh, Naaman uh, in verse number 9, so Naaman came with his horses and stood with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him saying, go wash in Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. But look at verse 11. He was, Noah was mad about it. And then, and then you go down to verse number 12. He says, Are not abandoned par far rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. When, when the message came to Naaman by the prophet, it was go wash in the Jordan, dip in the Jordan seven times. Now the law of exclusion comes into play. How do I know that? Because here is Naaman, and he begins to argue like people do today. He says, well, water's water. Rivers are rivers. And aren't the rivers up there in Damascus area, aren't they as, as good or better than the waters here? But when God said, listen, brethren, when God said go dip seven times in the Jordan River, that excluded every other body of water in the world. Not only that, it excluded every number. Would Naaman have been clean if he went to that river and dipped in it one time and said, I've dipped in the water? No. The law of exclusion said seven times. And that's what God intends. That's what God intends for us. That, that's what God intends for the entire world. To hear what he has said, put what he said in the place rather than me saying, why not? Why can't I? Or I think. Another passage we could look at is in Matthew chapter 26. Look to Matthew 26. In Matthew chapter 26, you'll remember in this chapter, the Lord is uh, instituting the Lord's Supper. And they've come and they're observing the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, Passover, which represented Israel coming out of bondage to Egypt. And here's the institution of the Lord's Supper, what we're going to observe this morning. Now, in this, we notice, look at verse number 17. The verse here says, and now the... Uh, now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? The unleavened bread, the Passover. Now, drop down with me to verse number 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, and break it and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which he shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine 
till that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. What did he say here? Unleavened bread, the fruit of the vine. We're going to observe the Lord's Supper this morning. Are we going to have unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine? Well, we are. But why not have milk and cornbread? I like that, don't you? Or we, we're, we might have chocolate milk and chocolate cake. God didn't say don't have chocolate cake and chocolate milk or uh, milk and cornbread or whatever else we might want to put on the table. God didn't say don't, but he said unleavened bread, the fruit of the vine, that excluded anything and everything else from the Lord's Supper observance. The law of exclusion. That helps me understand what God intends for me to do. Go to another passage in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 19. Now keep in mind the law of exclusion. Keep in mind Revelation 22, 18 and 19. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse number 2. God has always said, don't you add to, don't you take away from what I've said. Now, look at this. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 19. What did he say? Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, look at that. What did he say? Singing. What did that exclude? Anything but singing. Singing is what God requires. And I can't add the instrument to that because I've added to what God commanded. I can't take away and say, we're not going to sing. Because God has said to sing. He's told us to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We're not going to be singing folk songs. We're going to be singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Look over to Colossians. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 16. Colossians 3 and verse number 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. What did he say? Well, he tells us there we're going to have psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. What are we, how, what, how are we going to use them? We're going to sing. Well, what if I add, what if we add the instrument? Does that violate Revelation 22, 18 and 19, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse number 2? Yes, it does. Because I added to what God had commanded. I can't add to it and I can't take away from it in order to be pleasing in the sight of God. You know, if you look at Matthew, go back to Matthew with me for a second. In Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew chapter 28, I want you to notice with me, uh, here, here is, is, is Jesus giving the statement about authority. Now, he's given the Great Commission. And we'll look at another passage here in just a moment about, concerning that. And, and remember, we're looking at this law of exclusion. What we're talking about is Bible authority. How do I know what to do? How do I know how to handle what I am to do by authority? Look at this verse. Beginning in verse number 18. Now watch what he says. He says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power, the American Standard says, All authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Now what did he say? He says, I have the authority. What's this authority about? The Great Commission. 
Whatever Jesus has said, that's what we're to do. The things that have come to these inspired men, these inspired men, could they have said, well, you know, the Lord told me to write this, but, you know, I, I think it would be better if we, can you see where we would be? If inspired men had had the same mindset that many people have today, He said, all authority, all power is given unto me. You go teach them whatsoever I have commanded you. If we have that in mind, we're not going to say, well, you know, my preacher says. Now, it's great and wonderful when the preacher says what God has said, because that's what we're to do. We're to proclaim the gospel. That's number one. Is that, did, was that the first bell? Okay, I just barely heard it. Look at Mark. Look to Mark 16. In Mark chapter 16, and, and you recognize these verses, but I want you, as I read this with you, apply the law of exclusion in these verses. Notice he says, verse 15, And he said unto them, Go, and, uh, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Now, let's just stop there. Now, look at verse 15. What did Jesus say to them? Go into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel. What does that exclude? Anything other than the gospel. Brother Andy and I and anyone else who is a Bible class teacher or preacher, we don't have the authority to teach anything other than the gospel. God's Word, and back it up with that by going to book, chapter, and verse. Not saying, here's what I think. Because every time I hear somebody say, here is what I think, what they're saying is, I know better than God. Whether it's going to add to or take away from They're saying, I know better than God. We live in a time frame in society where people like to say, well, you know, we've got to get modern. And we do. I'm, I'm glad we've got things that are modern. I, I remember I was raised down in southwest Arkansas, and, and we'd go to worship and didn't have any air conditioning, didn't have any kind of heating except that one stove. I'm glad we've got something. But we can't change the message. When he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, that excluded anything else. But he goes on in this. And he, there he says, uh, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Well, what did Jesus say brought about salvation? The preaching of the gospel. But not just the preaching of the gospel. Because the gospel was preached in Acts chapter 2. When the people that day said, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you. And then he goes on to say, with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this onward generation. The Bible then says, then they that gladly received the word were baptized. The gospel was given, but not everybody was baptized. Therefore, not everyone was added to the church, Acts 2, verse 47. But how many times have we heard people say, Mark 16, verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And they'll say, but I think, or they'll say, I feel, I feel. I had a study not very long ago, and a guy said, my, I, I know that's what it says, Tony. And I, I, I pointed out to him, it was in red letter. We had a red letter edition Bible. And I asked him, I said, who said that? Well, he said, that's Jesus' words. I said, well, when Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He's saying we have to be baptized. And he said, well, my preacher, I asked him about that. My preacher said, you don't have to be. Now, let me ask you a question. Did that preacher and that person take away from what the Lord said? Remember we said a moment ago, whatever he uh, has, has given to us, taught us, that's what we're to do. Do I take away from God's word when I just simply say, all you have to do is believe? Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You see, the law of exclusion is a powerful, powerful,
powerful law. If we just take it and use it as we study with other people. In fact, I think this is one of the first lessons that ought to be taught to people as you go into a Bible study with someone. But understand, here is what God has said. One time I read a bumper sticker, it said this. This has been a long time ago. I don't even look at bumper stickers anymore. But this one said, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Well, that's not true. God said it, and that settles it, whether I ever believe it or not. God's Word is our authority. Thank you for your kind attention.